Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you are not too tired by now, and I can grab your attention for a few more minutes. For the next 20 minutes, I will try to make it in 15, so you can go for coffee. Um, we are going to talk, uh, I'm going to talk about a particular time in type history, one that is um, kind of forgotten. Um, there was uh, a period of about 100 years, started in the late uh, 19th century, when uh, a, ma a machine allowed uh, many people to compose and print documents in a very easy and, and immediate manner, something that was not available for many before. And I wouldn't like you to take this uh, presentation just as an historical presentation, but I would like you to think of the machine as an example of how uh, technical limitations can become an opportunity to be creative. And we will start going back to the 1870s when the first commercially manufactured typewriters were created. We are talking of the writing ball in Denmark and the typewriter in the US. Uh, in this uh, sample of the writing ball, we can already see spot some of the key features of typewriters manufacturers sorry, typefaces manufactured were for mechanical typewriters. They were monospace. Both the writing ball and the typewriter, also called Remington one later, um, the machine was only, uh, only allowed to write in uppercase letters, and the writing was invisible, so the typist was not able to see what they were writing. With the arrival of the Remington two, uh, people um, were able already to write both in uppercase and lowercase letters, and in here we already gonna see uh, that conventional typewriter typeface we all recognize, like the low contrast slab um, typeface. Unfortunately, I was not able to find a typewritten sample, but instead I found this catalog from 8085, a bit later, from the arrival of, of that model, and here we can already see like different uh, typefaces created for the Remington models. We see an italic, for example, different sizes for the conventional typeface, and also different styles for all uh, caps fonts. Um, I was mentioning that conventional typeface, uh, but we have to bear in mind that in the typewriter industry, the concept of a typeface family uh, was not the same as in the printing industry. And uh, for mechanical typewriters, every single typeface face was independent from the others. And they had different sizes. Um, the most conventional ones were Pika and Elite, and that's how they call in the typewriter industry these sizes. The way they measured the size of a typeface was also different from the printing industry because they were measuring the sizes by the characters you could fit in one inch. And maybe you think that these uh, two uh, samples I'm showing here are the same, but as you can imagine being type designers, uh, or type designers in the, in the audience, you need to adapt the structure of the characters and make some optical arrange arrangements for fitting um, the same design into a bigger or a smaller width. And um, also like this sample I, I saw before, the conventional typeface, you can find these peak and elite typeface, uh, typefaces in different companies and different typewriter manufacturers, but not all of them use the same typeface. Some of them created their own Pika and Elite typefaces, and some others uh, bought the typefaces to type factories like um, Ransmeyer and Rodrian in Germany. And those small differences between the Pika and Elite typefaces were used by document examiners for identifying uh, the model that a document was written on. And we could find uh, back, there, back then um, examples in criminology and forensics, like the uh, very recent Calibri case that I'm, I'm sure you all know. And this leads me to one of the first uh, references we can find about the identification of a typewriter typeface in, in for document examiners. And it's in a book of Sherlock Holmes written by Arthur Conan Doyle 
and he was saying that it is a curious thing that a typewriter has really quite as much individuality as a man's handwriting. And he was not referring to the different typefaces used by different manufacturers, but he was mainly, or I would say he was mainly referred to how every particular model, every manufacturer, uh, was a bit different. Was a bit different, and how much the human touch influenced the final result, because it was not the design. The printing quality of uh, typewriters was not very high, and uh, the result you got was not exactly the design that you created for the machine. And how uh, the way you press a key was influencing as well the final result. But the history of the typewriter was not linear, and in the first decades, uh, there was a fierce competition between uh, companies, and all of them wanted to create like the most uh, functional, lighter, and um, best mechanics for the machine. You can see here in these examples I have chosen different arrangements for the keyboard, and also different mechanics. And I have chosen these three, because of the printing device they were using. That printing device they were using already in the uh, 19th century was not uh, too different from some others that came much later. In the case of the Hammond, it was a mechanical typewriter, and it was already possible to change the typeface in the machine with those uh, type saddles. The index uh, typewriter Victor used a daisy wheel, a metal daisy wheel, and if you, can, if you have a look there, it's not that different in shape to the daisy wheel that came much later for electronic typewriters and word processors. And the Blickensdorfer, not sure if I'm pronouncing that well, um, a, it, it used also, it was an electric typewriter already, and it was uh, using a, a type wheel that was very similar in shape to the very famous uh, type ball or golf ball used by IBM's Electric in 1961. But one of the main questions for me in this research that, by the way, started at Reading University, we were talking about crediting yesterday, so I think it's important to say that, uh, it was how was designing a typeface for a typewriter? What were the particularities of the machine? What was different from the printing industry? And all the manufacturers needed to take into account uh, different measurements. Uh, in this case, we are seeing a, a graphic from a type bar, but I highlighted there one, that is the uh, radius of, the, of curvature, and it's the curvature of the metal type, because this is very specific to the typewriter. And for those of you, I'm, I'm sure um, there's people in the, in the audience that uh, never use a typewriter. I'm showing here how more or less it works, the mechanics uh, from inside. So you were pressing a key, and that key um, was um, making um, a metal type bar um, printing the letters in a roller, a cylindrical roller. So it is important to, to, to say that you were not using a flat surface. So you needed to, make mat to match the curvature of the metal type with the specific place where that tie bar was going to hit the, the roller. And already in the first decades of the 20th century, um, we can find like many different fonts and typefaces created for the machine. And I have found these two ads from Hammond typewriters, and they were mentioning they had over 300 sets of type. Of course, that doesn't mean those 300 were different designs, because as we have seen before, there were different sizes, but the steel, I think, is a lot. And they were mentioning as well that uh, those uh, sets of type, as they call it, um, uh, were available in 30 different languages. You can see like a small sample um, in the second ad, yeah, and it included already like a connected script. You can imagine how difficult it was with the alignment to get that really connected script. And uh, in the case of the multiplex Hammond, I think it is important this model as well because it included a reversible carriage, and that means that you can move the carriage from right to left and from left to right, and that allowed for using uh, also like scripts like Arabic, 
or Hebrew in this typewriter. And from a bit later, I found this catalog from the manufacturer I, I mentioned before. They call themselves Type Factory, which is a name I, I really like. And they were working in, in the industry from before, but they joined uh, the companies in the 20s. And I found there in that catalog uh, 14 different scripts, besides all the other languages with different diacritics for, for the typewriter. And this, probably the design of, of these samples I'm showing here is not very impressive, and there are specialists in, in the audience, you can tell me later. But they were making an effort, and different companies created uh, typefaces for different, different scripts because they wanted to make the machine available for different communities and different countries and make the market more global. And um, there were many typefaces. Uh, we have seen that. Uh, but there were some that were more, most, uh, more successful. And it's true that the very strange or weird ones um, are not very well known because uh, the sales were not that big in those, uh, in those typefaces uh, using the machine. But there was one that I, I wanted to show you as well because in the second half of the 20th century, this techno um, uh, typeface, techno cubic typeface, it was uh, called like that in the industry, it was kind of successful and it was taking some of the place of that conventional slab we have seen before. It was very, uh, kind of easy to, identi to identify the second sample uh, because it was designed inside Olivetti and it was Quadrato by Arturo Rolfo. Even the designer was credited there and it was originally designed for the Olivetti Valentine. But in the case of the first sample, it was not that easy. I needed to dig a, a, bit, deeper, a bit deeper, and I found at the end it was uh, created by Rance, Mayer, and Rodion, and they identified that, uh, that, that typeface with the number 85. And you can see here as well, those are cubic, oh, sorry, elite and pica um, cubic typefaces, so different sizes. And the last part of my presentation is going to be about a particular company. It's the company I know more because it was the specific topic of my research when I was in Reading. The research has grown a lot since then, but still I think it is interesting to see how uh, this type design thing was working is inside a company. And in this cover of a, of a catalog from an exhibition in Los Angeles in 1979, we can already see how type design uh, was, uh, had its own category uh, within the design, design area. And thanks to the University of Reading, of Reading, I was able to visit the historical archive in Ibrea, in the north of Italy. And uh, I always, when you, when you go to an historical archive, it's an adventure, because you never know what you are going to find. And I found this book that I wanted to share with you, because they created a manual for the company, for people working in typeface design, for giving them some recommendations and, and telling them some of the particularities of the machine so it was easier for them to create typefaces. One of the pages included these samples of how uh, the material a ribbon was made of influenced the final result. And if you, know how, how, if you don't know how it works, in the, in the typewriter, they use a transfer method. So the metal type was hitting a, an ink ribbon, and it was that ink ribbon that printed the letters on paper. And that caused the spread of the ink, and it was very difficult to get sharp uh, outlines. It was improved with time because they were, they, they were using different materials. Some other... Um, recommendations they were making in, in that manual were references to some measurements like the how large uh, you need to make the apertures for, for the letters not to be closed when they were printed or, or not uh, doing the joints too sharp or that particular shape, for example, the W that is very common in typewriters because uh, if um, I just remind you that they were for mechanical typewriters, they were monospace. So if if the join, the middle join of the W was a bit lower, you created some more wide uh, wide space in 
inside and it was not that dark, so to create a, a better color in text. And this was very interesting as well because they even included some optical adjustments you could use for getting a better result. So the first image you see is like what you want to get, and the second is what you can do for getting that first image. So some ink traps, some distortions in the corners because it was very difficult to reach with the ink the, the corners of the outlines. And just another thing I want to mention about Olivetti and, uh, is that they created their own typefaces and they had people working inside the company for, in the type design department. But they also commissioned external designers. There are big names there. Uh, Cassandra, for example, which was mentioned in other talks uh, during these uh, days. Uh, and I just wanted to mention this particular example because I think it's very interesting that Cassandra and Rainer were um, commissioned to design a proportional typeface for a mechanical typewriter. This model at the end was not a success in the market, but they were trying to make things uh, a bit different. And when I'm, I'm saying proportional, of course, there were limitations and it was not proportional as in printing type. They had five different widths, and within those five different widths, uh, they needed to create all the character set. And here it goes. Uh, you can see here, if you can read it, uh, probably one of the first uses of variable font in, in the industry, variabile in Italian, if I pronounce it well. They use that term for referring to those proportional typefaces they created. And you can see also some different script samples um, on top. And there, not sure you can read it, but there's a small number in blue. And that was the width of every character, because not every script used the same width, depending on this specificities or the particularities of every script, they needed to make it like uh, wider or uh, smaller. And these two samples I am showing here is the Cassandra and Rainer typefaces that they created for the, for the Olivetti Graphica. I think they are, they are very interesting designs because they didn't took this uh, commission um, they, they were kind of free. They didn't uh, have like um, rules for creating, they were, um, they could be creative with, with what they created. And these samples, I got those from typecast. I don't know if you know what it is, but typecast are blog posts um, uploaded to the internet, usually by typewriter collectors or typewriter enthusiasts that just uh, print um, comments and information about their model typefaces and they just scan it and upload it to the internet. And I'm really thankful they keep on doing that. And they even share many times like um, very nice pictures and sometimes from the type slacks. And there you can also like, see more uh, details of the design, but also you can see a small number there. And that it was used by the companies for identifying the typeface that was used in a particular machine. And sometimes you could even see the logo of the manufacturer. So it was easy if you had the machine to identify the, the typeface. And I just wanted to finish uh, because, as you can imagine, um, uh, summing up uh, 100 years of existence in just uh, 20 minutes is not enough. And uh, I mentioned these sources before, but I did a compilation. So for those of you that are interested in the topic, you can dig a bit deeper in here. It's not very easy to find specialized publications of book or books about this particular topic. So uh, if you dig a bit here and there, you can find pieces and uh, here and there, and at the end, I think that's part of the fun. I will be happy to take this presentation further in a formal conversation during the coffee break, just so I'm just going to finish here. Thank you. <laughs>